I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that discussion uh, with uh, with Grant Williams. He's phenomenal, and and I think what he what he had to say about having you know these respectful, good back and forth discussions is more of what we want to be doing today. So I have two more, uh, and uh, very happy to welcome Jeff Kleintop. First time that I've had you on on Hedge Eye TV. I've had Liz Ann on; she's wonderful. Um, but again, uh, great to have you on because we have a we have a ton of Schwab um, uh, ton of Schwab's clients that are obviously subscribers. Uh, mutually to both of us, so I'm sure that they're interested to ask you uh, questions. We'll have that Q&A, as I pointed out um, in the last 15 minutes. Um, but for me, it's you know, it's it's great because I get another strategist to go back and forth with. So, uh, thanks for making the time. Hey, thanks for having me. A uh, longtime follower on Twitter, and so this is uh, this is a great opportunity to interact. And um, yeah, my first time on the show. Looking forward to maybe the first amendment. That's awesome. Uh, and you're just just outside of Boston. We have an office there, and. Um, and, and like you're saying, everything's uh, healthy and well with you over there. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, uh, thanks for that. Now you have the you have the uh, the great task of trying to predict what uh, you wrote about most recently, which is the slope uh, of of what's happening currently and how we come out of it. This is it has to be for guys like you and I the hardest thing uh, that we've ever tried to do and actually keep a straight face and think that we know the answer. Um, and, and to me, like I, I'm quite I'm quite interested to hear how you think about the slope of the decline and the recovery. Uh, let's start with the U.S. first, and I know that you have thoughts, obviously, on the rest of the world. Well, it's amazing what where we've come just in recent weeks. I mean, the idea that we were going. We still are in an economic free fall, but the idea that maybe there's an end in sight that with the idea that we're going to see some reopenings, we're now past the peak and at least the first peak in COVID-19 cases, the idea that things may reopen and that we get some form of economic rebound. We don't know exactly what the timing is, but the market's come a long way in pricing in the idea that we're near the end of the free fall and that there's some form of rebound, whatever shape it takes, some form of rebound coming. That's the easy part, however, the hard part as you point out, still lies ahead. What shape does this recovery take? It's not up to just a politician anywhere, whether it's the White House or 50 governors around the country deciding that it's gonna happen on this day. It's a decision made by millions of individual people, thousands of individual businesses, in terms of when they feel safe operating mm -hmm. again. But that's very hard to say. Yeah, when, when I think about it, I mean, and, and I, I wanna go through all three of these different uh, buckets that at least my, my head currently has, like these three buckets in my rock full of heads. Um, but I mean, you, one, the, 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 the actual workout period uh, of any recession that you've analyzed, obviously. Two, the behavioral, the new reality. And three, the regulatory. Uh, the regulatory one is, is quite interesting to me because I, I obviously have no idea uh, w what the regulatory environment is going to look like. But first, when you think about the workout period relative to prior U.S. recessions, I know there's only really one depression. How do you think about the slope uh, relative to those? Well, it's hard to say. Again, we've never seen one enter this quickly and result from such a, a weird exogenous shock. And so uh, it's nearly impossible to predict. Some of the things that I'm watching, uh, I'm going to be watching You know, rush hour traffic. We can take a look at GPS data to see how quickly people come back. We can take a look at weekend box office receipts to see how quickly uh, they're willing to interact with each other in, uh, in an entertainment format. Uh, we can take a look at air pollution. Have you seen some of the pictures taken of the Los Angeles skyline? You can actually see it now. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Uh, maybe that goes away again. We'll have to see to, to the degree that it does. Overnight shipments from FedEx and UPS will be watching the data on that as well. All these kind of high frequency indicators to let us know right now it's a total gap. Yeah, but, but we do have the tools, and to measure and map that is, is a great idea. How about on the, um, you know, on the second piece, on the behavioral front, have you thought about how the world um, might look different uh, as of now and going forward in any, in, in, under any economic recovery? Well, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of CapEx. I mean, we haven't seen much in a long time. Businesses haven't spent, didn't see the need to. But now the resiliency of their businesses are, are a critical issue. The fact that many businesses had vulnerable supply chains, you know, they only had one supplier in some other country somewhere, uh, or, or a supply chain that was really dependent on a lot of links in that chain. And we know now any one of those links can go down and cause major bottlenecks. So the idea that we're going to need multiple supply chains, multiple locations of fabrication, all that multiplication doesn't necessarily mean a lot more costs, but it does mean a bit more investment in the near term. So I think you're going to see uh, businesses focus more on localization than globalization, making products locally in order to serve those local markets. And again, that's going to be more industrial, more capital goods, going to need more technology. I think a lot of people are thinking, hey, this is all just about how the consumer is going to react. But I think the business side of it may come first 
and they're going to be quick to spend to make sure they have the resiliency they need. Uh, and the boards of these businesses are going to demand that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also the, the two-step process of having the cash flow to invest there. Uh, but we do have a bridge. We have the new uh, Fed to Treasury uh, MMT potential bridge that's building here. So the, well, I'll get into that, too. But um, but on the third point, on regulatory, like what, what, what have you heard and what do you think on that front? Because that's going to uh, restrict or and or change consumer behavior as well, obviously. Yeah. Well, I, we'll have to see where that goes. I think, um, you know, what we've seen, it's interesting what people are willing to uh, to put up with after one of these crises. I mean, yep. We see it with the TSA, uh, you know, and, and uh, the question as to whether all these things make us safer, but they're things that we're willing to go through with frictions being put on economic activity. And we'll have to see where that goes. Again, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how China has reemerged and what they've done here and how everyone's temperature gets checked. Like every 15, you enter a store, they check your temperature, You all yeah. these kind of things going on. And we'll, we'll see how that uh, has a, I mean, it's unlikely to have a, a, a robust uh, impact on economic activity, more likely to have a chilling effect, but we'll have to see where that goes. I'm not sure if that's where you're going on the regulatory front. Yeah, 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 yeah it's, that's exactly what I meant. I mean, and, 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 and since I, I know you follow uh, China and Asia very closely. I mean, maybe just step to that. Uh, Singapore, you know, I, I think it, a, a pretty good argument would be made that they had uh, the tightest regula regulatory setup that one could have. Uh, it's reported on, on, on a website daily, who has it, where they got it, et cetera. Um, but now they end up with, with, with phase two of this. I mean, it started breaking out again this week. You know, have, have, you, have you paid much attention to Singapore and what's actually hap what's happening there? And if, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, this is a concern that as people begin to interact again, that we get another another surge in cases and whether we go back to the peaks, you know, this week, uh, we, well, I mean, South Korea never shut down, Japan never shut down, China did, but you know, I'm not entirely sure we can trust their data. So I'm looking more to Europe as an example of this. Austria just opened on Tuesday, uh, some tracking how that how that begins to go and how those cases begin to shape up. Uh, Denmark, I think, is today. Norway is on Friday. So we'll start to get a sense from countries whose data we have a little bit more respect for uh, in terms of how that's shaping up, how their daily caseload is changing and being impacted by increasing interactions of people. That's going to be critical because if we have a second peak in cases, you can expect a really ugly economic scenario, a, a W-shaped kind of Great Depression type scenario that we really want to avoid. So that's why these staged uh, reopenings are very important and seeing it begin to happen in, in a few different countries rather than everywhere at once uh, is a little bit comforting to me and, and, and the idea that we may be able to contain it. Well, the, the, the idea of the virus coming back, I mean, we've had uh, multiple uh, guests in the last three days walk through different timing of that, uh, but, but fully expecting that. I think that that's actually, uh, at least in, in, our, um, in our echo chamber, um, uh, an expectation. Um, so that doesn't that, at a bare minimum, create, like, people like, like to ask guys like you and I, what shape is it? You know, what letter is it? Uh, at a bare minimum, if we're coming out of something, doesn't that mean if you're going, if it's coming back, you're going to have some series of W's? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, it, within some countries, I think that haven't taken adequate precautions or don't have the health infrastructure to deal with it. I think the question will then be around antivirals, vaccines, and the degree to which our hygiene habits have changed. I mean, how often are we all going <laughs> to wash our hands now or wear masks in public? I mean, maybe that can help. Certainly, we're likely to see a little bit of a, a rebound in caseload. Do we go back to a new peak? Do we see new highs? That worries me a little bit. I, I think maybe our behaviors have adapted such to the point where uh, we can see a bit of a containment. Look, Ebola never went away, right? It still comes back every year, but but to a lesser degree than what we've seen in the past. And that's true for many of these. We've had 12 pandemics over the last 50 years. None of them are wiped out. They all come back, but they come back to a more limited degree. Hopefully that's the case with this one, but there's no way to know. Well, to, well when you start getting people to come back, you know, and, 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 and that's been another point. I think Danielle DiMartino Booth, who came uh, to us from Texas yesterday, she's like, hey, look, I, I can see you guys up there in the Northeast. It's not like that here in, in Tejas. You know, people are, it doesn't look like much has changed. Uh, something's changed, but not, it's not like the whole country is actually shut down. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, but there's also just, you know, the risk management exercise of, of just sitting there, you know, two hands on the wheel and saying every day, did it or did it not? I mean, I don't, I personally don't know any other way. I hear everybody's opinion on what could, should, or would happen, but I, my style is to just deal with what is. Um, do you agree with that uh, in terms of like when you get up in the morning, what you're doing, or are you looking for an answer? 
Well, uh, in terms of in terms of uh, uh, how the how the how this plays out in terms of the viral outbreak or in terms yeah, of the it, economic crisis. Yeah, but well, all of it. I mean, if you if you're being as a chief investment officer, like and strategist of, of a major firm, you know, I'm, I'm assuming there's an incredible amount of pressure on you to make a call on when to get in. You know, when do we get in, Jeff? I mean, so you know, you either say I don't know, uh, or you're getting. Some people I've seen. Some people. I mean, it's not not you, but some people have said the bottom's in. You got to get in now. Yeah, the smart answer is I don't know. And and the truth is that this rally that we've seen doesn't surprise me at all. Again, we've gone from pricing in an economic refall to, refall to pricing in at least the first peak in, in new cases and some visibility about uh, around these reopenings. That was the easy part. Shutting down the economy and getting the virus cases to peak was the easy part. The hard part lies ahead. What does the recovery look like? We talked about millions of decisions by individuals, thousands of decisions by businesses, and, and of course, the, the potential for uh, uh, another uh, return of, uh, of, of the viruses as we interact again, that we don't know. And that's why we've got to track this data very closely. So I, I think that there are obviously a couple of scenarios ahead. One is that we head right back down again, that the, um, the, the virus really hasn't been contained and that we're going to see a much, much longer economic downturn of, of frozen economic activity. Uh, the other scenario is that we get this V-shaped rebound with all the stimulus in place and pent up demand. And I think that the truth is we don't know and, and it probably maybe lies somewhere in the middle. And that means the market is a much harder time making progress now mm -hmm. uh, going forward. Now that we've come back this far uh, and have priced in so much in terms of, of the restarting of the economy, again, the hard part lies ahead. Yeah, uh, the, I mean, that, that. I think that's a fair answer. I don't know how else. Um, I mean, I, I actually, to my point, I, 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 I do struggle with how other people have tried to answer the question with such certainty and i know people need and want certainty but it doesn't sound like you're uh, you're on board with that <laughs> the, um, well, but here's the, here's the thing and, and i know because you've you had liz in on the show i think it was late last year and i remember watching some of the clips and we were we were we were cautious i mean yeah. our view you know starting last summer we saw the yield curve invert i'm a big fan of the yield curve as a signaling tool i've used it for the last 25 years of my career and you know i don't care what powell says i don't care what you know yellen says or, or bernanke or greenspan going back how they dismissed it or how wall street dismisses it i think it's a sign of a vulnerability in the economy we never know what the catalyst or the shock is going to be but we know there will be one when we see a global economy that was slowing throughout the year last year right. earnings slow throughout the year last year and then this this don't know what the shock is going to be but it's it, it's going to be something maybe it would have been trade or who knows what but it was this shock. And, and so we have been cautious recommending rebalancing on after had run up really on no earnings growth or economic growth last year. And so now, uh, you know, we're not saying, hey, time to stop being cautious. We still think caution makes a lot of sense here. But I think that uh, a, a lot of investors have turned around and said, well, obviously, we're going to see this V-shaped rebound on stimulus. There's still way too much confidence in the central bank that they can afford any kind of problem that faces this economy. I think they have the wrong tools to address this one. Well, that, I mean, that was appreciated, by the way, and that's why I think uh, Lizanne built so much credibility on our channel, is that, you know, the, the U.S. economic cycle peaked at, at the end of the third quarter of 2018, and the global economy peaked before that. So, the, you know, shocks don't slow economies out of nowhere. Um, so thanks for just stating that plainly. Um, but when I, so, so that's actually quite, quite to the point how I, I, I go back, you know, so I go to back to where the world starts slowing first, which is primarily in Asia. So when I when I wake up in the morning and I'm measuring and mapping what's going like the Philippines stock market today, and not that everybody's paying attention, but down seven percent last night. Uh, Indonesia down another three percent last night. Thailand down another three percent last night. It, it, when you look at EM, because that's part of your your part of your job, you know how much of that signal? Because um, again, this isn't new. These markets have been in bear markets for quite some time in, in emerging markets, Asia in particular. You know what? At, at what point is is that not just a reasonable place? to say, okay, that's that's actually exhibit number one. That's how this goes. Yeah, that's an important thing to watch because, yeah, and, and commodities are telling that that signal as well. We're, we're, we're seeing this weakness and it, it exposes vulnerabilities in those parts of the global economy that are, uh, that tend to be the canaries in the coal mine. And so we are seeing this show up. We're not seeing much relief there. Global right. financial conditions uh, haven't gotten easier. Maybe they've stopped tightening at the pace they were thanks to what central banks have done, but they've got, not gotten easier. The dollar continues to rise. It's up again today. Yeah. Uh, all that shows that there are still tensions in the global economic system and, and our important feedback loop in terms of, well, what does that mean? Uh, there are so many links in the chain globally 
And some of those are clearly breaking down here. And it, it does point to the problems there that aren't easily resolved. We even hear it from businesses now. Many of them are, are talking about coming back, but they can't because their supply chains right. are disrupted because they're tied to many of these countries in areas that uh, that, that provide them with uh, with important components. Yeah, and that dollar, I mean, that, that noose that is the U.S. dollar, particularly on EM's dollar-denominated debt, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the dollar is a very important thing to watch here. Uh, the dollar is, is uh, so many countries around the world borrow, into, companies around the world borrow in dollars, as we know, because they're either their revenues are sourced in dollars or they're buying commodities that are dominated in dollars. So it's a really good sign when it goes up that they're having trouble getting the cash they need to operate. So the fact that it's up again today, <laughs> stock, stocks have come back so far, yet yet we're still having trouble with many of those businesses. So that is a that is a key sign. I'd also note that the two-year yield in the U.S., the two-year Treasury yield, has not shown any signs of picking back up again. <laughs> Look, if the Fed is successful in doing what it's doing, we ought to see some kind of hope there that something in the next two years, growth might pick up or inflation may pick up. But we're not. Those are two important signs. It goes down every bloody day. I mean, it's uh, it is what it is. And I think if you're if you're a, like uh, I don't think there's a secret here. I, I like I've been a Treasury bond bull for um, over a year and a half now. And 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 you know the the the, the bond market nailed it. It nailed the whole bloody thing. It continues to nail it every day. Like you said, I mean, if you ask the interest rate market, which is what you just pointed out, two-year yields making new cycle lows every day, that is what it is. Ten-year yield obviously coming in, trying to get back to its lows. You look at the commodities market on the lows, oil on the lows. It's just this bloody U.S. equity market that people have panic attacks on. It's, it's certainly not equity markets, like I said, in the Philippines or Indonesia this morning. Um, but, but do they maybe need people like Jim Cramer kind of like cheering it on a little bit? Maybe that's their problem. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that clearly there's uh, there there are a couple of different views, and I think the closer you are to, you know, if if every day you're taking a look at do what's the Fed doing today, or you're talking to Fed officials, I mean, I think you'd come away with a different view. I'm I'm a big skeptic when it comes to central bankers, and and I, I you know I call them the guardians of the economy, and I've got this whole cartoon series I do about them. I just think we have way too much faith, and they have too much faith in their ability to call. <laughs> I remember going to a dinner, this was a few years ago, and Janet Yellen and, and Bernanke Greenspan and Volcker were there, and they were asked this question about, hey, how, how, are you, how, how would you grade yourselves at being able to, uh, to, to uh, uh, diffuse uh, recessions? And got very academic answers for most of them. Volcker was the only one that kind of leaned back in his chair and said, ah, we have recessions before the Fed, we have recessions after the Fed. All we can do is maybe try and clean up the mess afterwards. And it's an honest answer, and maybe the only honest answer we've got. For <laughs> well, uh, and, and, and I'd appreciate that. Thanks for saying that, because that's a great uh, lead into another series of questions, which is quite seriously, Bernanke and Yellen, uh, and, and not only did Yellen like double down on it, but Bernanke started with it. He started with, as you know, the new normal paper um, way back when that said, we're, this is the new normal. Uh, central banks can suppress market volatility. We'll never have an economic event or a market event because of me. Yeah, and this notion that, that the global savings glut was what was pushing down interest rates and not, and not other signs of, of, of pressure that, uh, that were clear. I mean, that was in 2006. He said global savings glut pushing down the yield curve. Ignore the, ignore right. the yield curve inversion. We're not going to get a recession. We got the biggest, you know, deepest, longest recession <laughs> we had. Well, that's that's how you get that's how you get to be head of the Fed, right? You got to write bullshit like that. Um, but, but but the problem is, it, you know, like the entire edifice of what I affectionately call the old wall, like Jamie Dimon, Fink, they all buy in to this. Like they believe more so maybe than than even Bernanke or Yellen themselves believe that this is the way that it should go, Jeff. This is an amazing time in U.S. history on that front. We have a tremendous amount of activity on my Twitter handle associated with that. Like, do you think, do you think it's possible that they could disintermediate economic gravity this time? No, I, and I don't think they, they ever have a good track record of doing this. I do think that they can do, um, they can help to get the financial system functioning again yeah. after it's, it's breaking down. Uh, but but in, or, in terms of foreseeing that or, or avoiding it, no, they've never shown an ability to do that. But this time they say they're doing more faster, Jeff. So that means that they've, they've always had it right in Bernanke's mind. He always, you know, and, and in fact, that's how he advises the Japanese and whoever else. He's like, you got to go bigger. If you just went bigger, we would have had it right. And they've, they've gotten pretty big pretty quickly. Well, it did. It did get big pretty quickly. And, and so I guess, you know, I just wonder, 
if they're successful, I mean, given the amount of stimulus they're putting in place, you know, one of the things I've been talking about over the last year was in the next downturn uh, in 2020, I think the Fed could go to zero again and restart QE. And people are going, no, 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 they never do that. <laughs> Boy, they did it fast. If they're successful, I can't imagine, you know, this is one of the interesting things that if you look at gold, and, and I think gold is saying, gosh, if they're, if they're not successful, we go into a Great Depression, gold's a great place to be. If they are successful, we get this inflationary rebound, then gold's another great place to be. So uh, it's sort of interesting, the message from gold. I'm not sure how the Fed's interpreting that. How do you, um, you know, given, you know, you know how, how, how you have, you know, your certain, uh, actually, I'm not even uh, well aware of your asset allocation or how you have to give your uh, set of strategies, but how how have you thought about gold historically as a percentage of of the total and one's asset allocation or the timing of it? We have a strategic allocation that does include precious metals, but it's not a huge, it's not a, a meaningful portion of the of the allocation in terms of a large uh, piece there. And from a tactical perspective, we haven't been dialing it up or dialing it down here. Honestly, I'm not much of an expert okay. on the precious metal. I just think I use it more of as a uh, what it's telling me about the rest of the market rather than uh, as a place to go. Though, though I would acknowledge it's certainly been an exciting place to be. You know, we were talking about it perhaps as a as a hedge back last summer when the yield curve inverted at what 1300 or so. Yeah. Um, um, certainly, a good place to be. Well, I mean, um, I mean, so you don't think I'm crazy because I own gold? That's I'm, we're good with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not crazy. Yeah, no, it, it's 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 kind of an amazing thing. Is is, is um, the asset allocation globally, as you know, uh, as a percentage of total assets to gold itself is is de minimis. I mean, um, so that might be you know big change that's on the uh, near term horizon. I do not know uh, how that's going to play out, but at least the direction is is getting people. Excited. Um, if, if you guys have questions, pop them in the queue. I'm going to definitely uh, go to Jeff here in the next uh, three or four minutes and start asking the ones that are the most popular. Um, but back on, just, uh, just to finish that and wrap it up on the Fed, um, there have been different people. Uh, uh, Bianco yesterday, Jim Bianco basically said, hey, look, this is to me, this is uh, MMT 1.0 uh, because we've effectively started to merge uh, the Fed and the Treasury. One, do you agree with that? Um, and two, what do you think about MMT? Um, I, yeah, it, it is a little bit of, I don't know if it's 1.0, maybe it's 0.5. I mean, it's certainly yep. a step in that direction. And it's hard to hear any voices pushing back against it. I mean, we usually, you know, whether it was the Tea Party or, or whomever was, was uh, stood up uh, in, in the face of these things, we just don't have those voices today. So it's interesting to see how quickly those walls fell down. I know that that was true in Europe as well as, European Central Bank rolled out this uh, uh, stability mechanism and essentially issued bonds and, and started uh, putting the money anywhere, regardless of the capital key. So kind of breaking down what had previously been a bar put up by some of the conservatives in Germany and elsewhere uh, against uh, shared fiscal future, uh, that fell down as well. So, you know, it certainly lowers the bar against doing this stuff during future crises, but it also lowers the bar against doing it well anytime. <laughs> um, unlimited, so, right? Yeah, unlimited. So I, I, I worry about MMT. I think the, the, the debt levels are the biggest thing that keeps me awake at night. I, I think uh, it's a real long-term problem. I'm watching Japan. They're, they're facing the, the biggest problem, and, and they're probably going to hit the wall first. But they invented zero interest rates first and QE first. So maybe they'll come up with some new plan to kick the can down the road. But I do worry about that. I don't think MMT is a solution. Well, I mean, it, you, you can go and if, if you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff's work, I mean, uh, not including the couple typos that they had. But of course, if you just look at the history of the matter, if you're triple digits debt to GDP and double digits and rising deficit to GDP, you're putting the noose on your financial system. Um, one, um, that, that has been Japan, uh, for example. Their upside on economic recoveries, as you know, has been de minimis. The downside, too, they, I think some people We'll call it social harmony. Um, but the, the reality is that's not America. I mean, uh, what do you think about that? Like one, do you agree with it? Do you agree that, because um, some, some people we've had on uh, believe that, uh, again, the Fed's balance sheet could be 15 trillion. Um, they can go unlimited and that there's no economic repercussion other than rainbows and puppy dogs. There are certainly uh, economic ramifications, but they may be forced upon us uh, through inflation. Look, I, I don't, we don't have a, a, a an outlook for hyperinflation, but but certainly seeing some inflation come back here is, is the possibility here. And that might force a bit of a change. If we've got to pay more for that debt, we have 
so much debt now that our leverage to interest rates is enormous. Now, maybe those rates continue to stay low, but at this pace of issuance, it's going to be very hard for the dollar not to fall and interest rates not to rise uh, under that MMT scenario. And that's forced discipline. It's something we've seen many other countries be forced uh, to deal with and possible the U.S. could be forced to do it too. Maybe it's just it's in the form of a, a weaker dollar. But, but again, given how much we import as a nation, that could be painful. Well, that um, I mean, that it's 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 alarming when you th really think about it. I mean, it's 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 been this Goldilocks environment where you can raise the deficit, uh, obviously post tax reform, and you could have falling unemployment. Now you you know, which you have all the time at the end of the cycle, you have both, as you know, rising unemployment. Certainly not at this pace, but uh, rising unemployment and rising deficit. It's it's classically uh, what happens in a recession. Uh, is is there is there a point actually that you think that the government would stop on that deficit as a percentage of U.S. GDP? Um, I don't know. It's it, hard, hard to say. And I don't even know what the I mean, what does the government look like? Uh, you know, come November, I'm not, not even entirely sure. There, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a scary proposition and, and one that we all have to think about. I, I think for one thing, you know, companies have become a bit more nimble in their operations, and so you know, as we think about, for example, the Japanification of the world, there are many wonderful J Japanese businesses. They're not tied to the fate of the Japanese government. Uh, and, you know, Sony can do whatever it wants. Toyota can do whatever it wants. They manufacture themselves way outside of that country. So they're not bound by the, the, the fiscal insolvency of, of the government uh, there. They can, they can move elsewhere. And that may be a sign in the future if companies begin to disconnect themselves from the countries that they're headquartered in. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, the, the history of Japan is a fascinating one. I, I, I think most Americans, particularly uh, where you live in Boston and where I live in Connecticut aren't looking for America to become that, but uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, last question on that before I take other people's questions. What is it, like you said, people aren't really saying much about this. I mean, you got, um, are they saying much in and around Boston? I mean, I could tell you around here, uh, the discussions while they're on Zoom and on discussions like this are quite fervent. Uh, it's, it's the number one question that I get, actually. There, there's two questions, and, and the first one is <laughs> absolutely what is going on with all this debt, and when are we going to pay the price? And there, some of them are just concerned about the return of maybe austerity in 2021. Others are concerned long term about yep. what does this all mean? Is it going to be a, a rebound in inflation? And I think you know, it, generally, it's a, it's a generational thing. We have the older investors, more fixed income focused, are worried about this enormous rise in debt, where the millennials not so much. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're, if you, first of all, if you've been loaded to the gills. Treasuries, gold, and dollars, um, it's been awesome, relative and absolute. You've had no drawdown. Um, so you should live in absolute fear of the, of the Fed uh, burning at the stake the U.S. dollar and or creating a credit profile like Italy has on the sovereign side of debt. Um, I know it's like the, the question everybody wants to have timing on, but I mean, uh, do you have any view on, on when that could change in terms of the complexion of risk in the Treasury market? And that's why I'm watching Japan so closely. I mean, look how far advanced they are in this, yeah. and it really hasn't changed there yet. I think sometime, sometime in the next five years it will. That's the canary in the coal mine. That's the one I'm watching first. And remember, if Japan blows up its, its situation in terms of the yen or, or the JGBs, it's largely a Japan problem. Most of the world doesn't own JGBs. They're generally owned by the Japanese postal system, as you know. And so it's a problem contained within Japan, but a big political one were it to get to that point. And I think other political leaders around the world can realize that if they start to see that unfold and take them action. So I'm watching Japan for it. Yeah, the uh, JGB, that's an interesting point. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's just like the most under thing in the history of best performing things, right? It's only gone up, it has no volatility, and it has abhorred every single thing that uh, an intellectual would have said that doing more and more and more, including, you know, as you know, QE to buy stocks would have done. It's a, it's a beauty, but nobody owns it, like you said. Yeah, it's like a scarcity, yeah. <laughs> well, to me, that's actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay in it to win it on treasuries until I start. I mean, to me, it's all about the volatility, actually, of the bond market, much like the volatility of the equity market. So when I look at the treasury bond vol index, the move index, and what it did before the Fed, and I do think that that's why the Fed had to jump in so aggressively with the 75 billion a day, what was happening for real was you're having down stock days with down treasury bond days. And those are the days that, you know, um, as uh, one of my favorite shows, I hate to admit this now, that's going to come out of my mouth, it might as well. You know, my days as a junior hockey player, we used to watch Days of Our Lives. These are the days of our lives. You know, the desecrator was in Salem. Um, and that's when, that, that would be a shit show for me. I mean, quite literally, because, um, and for a lot of people, because they're long, they're, they're long treasuries. Uh, and that's, that's been a good position to have.
Absolutely. All right. Um, good thing you didn't have a follow-up comment on the on days of our lives. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're probably around the same age, so uh, that is what it is. Um, life as a Canadian hockey player. All right. I'll just um, I'll, I'll get into the questions here. Um, let's see here. Jeff, what's your take on paper cash internet? It's an interesting question. Uh, this has got uh, a lot of votes. Jeff, what's your your take on paper cash? internationally moving forward due to the virus. There have been YouTube videos circling around of people in South Korea burning their cash because of germs. <laughs> wow, um, <laughs> I haven't seen those. One of the interesting things that's, that's been surprising to me is what we're seeing in Europe. The, the number of, so the biggest denomination of Euro note is a 200 Euro note. And the number of them in circulation has gone up 50% in the last six or nine months. I mean, just an enormous surge of people actually pulling money out of the banking system, holding it in paper and putting it, I guess, in the old mattress portfolio because they're worried about negative interest rates. They're worried about the ECB further lowering into negative territory and eroding their savings. So they'd rather hold cash, totally undermining the point of lowering, essentially disintermediating the whole financial system. So I think that's pretty clear that negative interest rates don't work and aren't going to work uh, going forward as you start to see more and more people pull this money out. So it's an interesting sign, has showed no signs of slowing down. Mm -hmm. uh, China, there are a couple questions here, more than a couple questions on China. And you did mention it and you did allude to your um uh, to the data being not that trustworthy, but um, you know, wh how do you how do you think this plays out for the Chinese from here? Well, I, I, it's dependent upon the rest of the world. Um, China does have a pretty good domestic market, but they still they're geared to build a lot of things for the rest of the world. So we'll have to yeah. see. You know, their their imports from Korea semiconductors did pick up quite a bit. They're restocking their supply chain, but if there's no end demand, that's going to soften up. So you know, we've been watching overnight shipments, uh, we've been watching traffic, we're watching air pollution, quite a few things, and they have be rebounded. It looks like so far a V-shaped rebound, but that seems unsustainable. So it might be more of a square root kind of thing where that flattens out maybe until the rest of the world catches up. I love that square root rates of change. That's that's right up my alley. Um, and, and and that's it's also like when I when I take the two big buckets and I want to get your uh, kind of your feedback on this. Like the two big drivers of global growth, if you're going to turn it on, I mean, one you got to have Chinese on the uh, Chinese industrial growth accelerating and and more so just from the bottom. Uh, so that's the big global industrial recession that we had. You know, turn that back on, and then you have to have the U.S. consumer not do what everybody clearly is worried it's going to do, because those are the two big engines uh, of global growth. One, do you agree with that? Uh, and is there something else you know, that you would, would add to that? I, I think that's really important. I think that's, uh, that's the key right there. Now, the, you know, China's domestic consumer is now bigger than the U.S. consumer in terms of global demand. So yeah. that's, that's an important factor as well. But, uh, you know, th their confidence clearly swings. I and mean, we can see it with auto sales in China. They're back to work, but we're not seeing a big pickup in auto demand there, which is a big ticket item, requires a lot of confidence, and it's just not there. So again, I think until you see the rest of the world turn around and show increasing signs that there's an end to this, I think that the Chinese consumer isn't going to be enough on their own, despite their size. Well, what's interesting with the Chinese consumer and Chinese consumer stocks is what I'm really thinking about here. Uh, it's not unlike in the U.S. You've seen a narrowing uh, leadership on rallies in the U.S. to the Netflixes of the world. Um, you know, things that where people are at least think that they're, they're taking share or they've had some kind of an anti-fragile model. Um, but in, the U in China, too, I mean, you know, whether it's JD or uh, another stock that we, we like, Pindodo, which is PDD. I mean, these things look like they didn't even know what was going on. Um, <laughs> you know, it, what part of the per capita consumption story in China um, just has runway anyway because they're coming from such a low point? Yeah, oh, you're right about that. I mean, certainly it's still on, still on an uptrend, and uh, the the you know just looking at average household income in China is still growing at a very very rapid rate, and that's that's enough to sustain some growth there. But you know, it, it, they don't consume on on uh, on credit; they just don't. Right. And and so it is about those jobs. And so it, you know, if we don't see the demand come up, and they're they're forced into you know partial shutdowns in the businesses or reduced hours, that's going to show up in their consumption. Yep. Uh, here's a question. This this must have just happened while you and I are talking, and since while I'm talking, I can't listen to something else on on television. Uh, I didn't know this. Uh, Cuomo just extended the pause to May 15th in coordination with other states. If we uh, if we see cases pick up in Denmark, Austria, et cetera, soon, do you see them not reopening until after the summer? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly if they see cases pick back up again, they're going to be very slow. I mean, they, they might be very selective in what they what they uh, allow to reopen. Uh, we've heard, you know, certain uh, um, certain facilities that that they're maybe not essential, but they're sort of you know slightly uh, uh, you know closer to essential than than, than say a, a you know a movie theater. Uh, they're starting to open some of those uh, some of those areas, and so we'll start to see what happens. But uh, that is a risk, and and the further that gets pushed back, the more disappointed the market's going to be. The market got excited that we're on the cusp of a, of a immediate reopening of everything. And that may not be the case. Yeah. Here's another good question. Jeff, is there, a, is there a, an investor, um, like in, in your client base, that would be quite interested in 40 and 50 year U.S. Treasuries? Um, you know, we've got investors that are looking for income and, and income that they can count on uh, over the long term. And I think 40, 50 year Treasuries, I think it all depends on how it fits into an, an overall picture that can help them. Be confident that they're going to hit the, those income goals, uh, maybe less focused on, you know, the capital appreciation side and more focused on where am I going to get income? And that's, that's hard to see just where yields are today. Yeah, I'd, I'd buy those. I mean, I'd buy, I'd buy any treasury at any duration, maybe not at this price. I mean, actually, today I was selling some treasuries, so I should just be clear about that uh, before people get confused. Um, we have that real-time alerts product where people would have seen that. Because, I, I, Jeff, I, own, uh, I don't own 50 or I own these ex extended duration bonds, zeros. I mean, I've been out there on the curve just betting on growth slowing uh, and staying slow. So that's just kind of the way that I've thought about it. Um, but, but I think a lot of people um, are quite interested in even 100-year bonds and, and, and COVID bonds, uh, for example. So we do get a lot of questions on that. Uh, here's another question, different topic. Um, uh, this, oh, geez, it just, uh, it just went away from me here. Oh, um, and this has to do with uh, the point that you made on the localization. You know, uh, how practical uh, do you think that is and what is the timeline to, 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 to have that kind of a, a CapEx cycle or a local investment cycle? You know, I think it is realistic. A number of businesses have done it. Look at what Nike is able to do with, with their miniaturization of manufacturing and the mobility of it and how they can rotate around different countries in Asia. Uh, I think it's becoming less about um, the price of labor. More and more of this is just becoming automated. I think the key is um, the fact that we have miniaturized the manufacturing process and we have found uh, ways of doing it, uh, it very efficiently. And, and I think that is realistic. You know, I remember um, uh, looking at, um, uh, I guess it was years ago, I think GE and, and how they, they made locomotives and the idea of just, they're very costly obviously to ship around and so if you can make them where you sell them it makes a lot of sense and how that began to be then applied to many other different products at GE and now we're seeing it across a lot of different uh, a lot of different consumer products I think it's going to be really important not only in terms of resiliency of the supply chain but in terms of customization of the product and price differentiation this is going to be really really important the businesses that do the best are the ones that are closest to the customer. And so if you can manufacture where your customers are based, you can customize better, you can tailor better, and you can probably price better. And that can make up for the additional costs that, that come with a, a more a diffuse supply, a more diffuse supply chain and production. Yeah, and your main point on this too is that is really that it's a behavioral one. You didn't, you, you got caught with your pants down. Uh, you know, first time, oh, okay, maybe not. Second time, you know, that's a problem. So, so change your behavior. Exactly. Good. Um, all right. Here's a cool question. Actually, this is, uh, I don't know if you're the one to ask, but uh, since you're, you're at Schwab, somebody's asking, uh, and it's got a lot of votes. Are trading fees gone forever, or does Schwab have a plan to reinitiate those things? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really have any visibility on that. No, I, I, think, I think, you know, fee compression in this industry, as in so many others, look, price is important, and probably more so in financial services than anywhere else. Yeah. And so... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, you can't run a business for free. So you've got to find areas where um, customers are maybe less sensitive to uh, 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 to pricing. But but yeah, I mean, look, this industry has become more and more focused on the consumer, more and more what's doing right, what's right for them. And, and I think that's all a good thing. Well, to me, I think it's an awesome thing. I mean, I, I don't work for Schwab or I don't work for, you know, I, I work for me. But I mean, um, but I, I think it's like a, I've called this a new dawn. I mean, the ability for an individual to transact or just institute their, their asset allocation with zero on the commission side, that, that's awesome. 
I mean, you and I grow up, grew up in an environment which was quite different than that. Most people had to learn how to trade with, the, with, with obviously, the fee component to what they're doing. This is, this, is, this is different. Do you get that feedback from, um, from the base of people that you talk to? Yeah, I mean, removing all the frictions from doing the right thing in your portfolio is, is so good. There's no longer this, ah, I'd have to pay for this or I'd have to do yeah. that. It's just just do it now. And that's that's really just the right thing for everyone. So, yeah, I'm happy to see that we've, we've, we've come here as an industry, for sure. Yeah, I mean, way. that's I mean, it really allows you to learn how to how to screw up faster. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can learn how to trade, but that's one of them, um, you know, is that you got to put it on. Right. And to put it on at no cost is different than. Uh, having a big transaction fee. Um, I, I guess that's a, a, another question that you, know, you can see kind of a, some an anxiety, I guess, a little bit in the Q&A. Um, do you think, and, and I, I think I kind of asked this question, do you think that people uh, have like a visceral, they're affected viscerally about needing to call the bottom at this point, even though the top is only two months looking backwards? Um, yeah. I, I... I think there's there's always that tendency to say, oh, I, I, I did that, I, I called that or whatever. And I think that um, we there's no way we have enough information to do this. Again, as I said, looking back was the easy part. Uh, you know, shutting down the economy and, and, and getting to a peak in cases and, and getting to the point where we could reopen. This is the hard part going forward. And I don't know. That's why I'm I'm going to track this data very, very closely on a real-time basis and really try and get an honest sense of what's going to happen. I'm not going to go into it with any preconceived notions as to how it should work uh, because we don't know. We've never been through something like this before. I'm going to observe how it actually is working and try to report that as directly and honestly as I can. I think those kind of insights are going to be more valuable than the opinion of, hey, I called it and I was right or I was wrong. Let's just let's just watch that data and see what it tells us. Yeah, you and I have that, that methodology um, you know, quite similarly. Because uh, again, it is what it is. And if you want it to be a different way, that may not be the way that it's going to be working out for you. Uh, I guess last question on this, and there have been different kinds of questions about this. Some people actually think that that answer uh, starts with valuation. <clears throat> so maybe um, just give you kind of a, a, an open space there to talk about that. I, you know, I, I don't think we know much about valuation. We know where the price is. We have no idea where the year E is. Uh, and, and it's you know, likely probably a lot lower than we even think it is. And so valuation probably isn't particularly attractive in this environment. Now, maybe on a 10 year basis, uh, it's still pointing to, 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 to positive returns for equities, maybe below average of positive returns. And that's fine. But in the near term, we can't count on valuation here because we just don't know what the E looks like. Yeah, on that, uh, guys, if you pop up slide 108, maybe Jeff can see that. Hopefully he can. Um, the, the, and again, I never start with this, but I get so many damn questions about it that I have to give the answer. Um, so what I used was a, a cyclically adjusted earnings number, um, you know, the CAPE ratio. So that, you know, that suggests max drawdown is 1,800-ish, 1,836. I don't know if you can see that or not, but um, you know, just, just thinking of market trough scenario analysis using a cyclically adjusted earnings number, um, that's the best I could do. I don't know what you think about that. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that certainly looking at, at valuation from a long-term perspective certainly points to below average rates of return. I've never found that the, the uh, cyclically adjusted PE ratio tells us much about where the low might be. Right. I, I just don't find it a very effective signaling tool. Well, that, I mean, that's great. I mean, uh, my last question, I guess, is on that specifically. Guys, if you have the update that I had this morning from the macro show on earnings, I mean, this is just god awful. I mean, this is Q1 and it's early, you know, so you're saying there's a chance, but, you know, of the, of the 34 companies that were reported, and again, it's a Q1 number, which doesn't include, you know, half the quarter was pre-virus, down 35% year over year earnings. I mean, that, we're not like, we came into the year, I don't, I don't think you had this outlook, but uh, people thought earnings were gonna be up in the mid to high single digits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know where they even thought that was gonna come from, but, but now, <laughs> Clearly, uh, we're in, in an earnings free fall, and, and no one has any idea where that's going to bottom out at. And there's still, um, uh, you know, a lot of questions. Again, this is millions of decisions uh, by people, thousands of decisions by by companies, and and there may be increasing costs that come along with now. As I talked about, some of the business resiliency issues that may come ahead of revenue. So this is a this is a really tough time to look at earnings in a really tough time. So I think what you have to look at is more of an understanding of what the trajectory, what, what the pay, is it a quick re earnings rebound or is it a very slow earnings rebound? 
not where are they now. It's, it's that trajectory going forward. And again, we don't know yet. Yeah, I think that's one of the most interesting and important things that you said. You said, I don't know more times, Jeff, than most people have the courage uh, and humility to, 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 to use those words. Those are important words, as you well know. It's not your first rodeo. Uh, and the other big uh, takeaway for me was also this whole concept of reinventing and recreating your business, which does uh, incur costs. Um, so, you know, there, there could be actually a, a slower recovery just because you're trying to do the right thing so it doesn't happen to you again. That, I thought that was a, a really important point. So thanks for just, you know, taking so many back and forth with me. I know that you, you answered questions all across the board from Days of Our Lives to the Philippines. So I appreciate your time. Bye, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. I had a great time. Look forward to being back sometime soon. All right. Take care outside of Boston there. I appreciate it. Uh, we have a lot of clients in Boston, by the way. We have uh, an office in Boston, too. Uh, he's Jeff Kleintop. Uh, I'm still Keith McCullough. I'm still here. I got one more. I got Steve Hankey coming up in about 15 minutes. Thanks.